What's up, heathens? How y'all doing? I'm the Godless Engineer, and I critically analyze apologist claims to give you the best arguments and information so that you can stand up and use your voice. Today, we're going to be taking a look at a Muslim philosopher who is going to be destroying atheism in five minutes. Now, I'm sure they only have the best information and the best arguments to refute atheism. It's definitely not going to be regurgitated presuppositional shit that we've heard for the longest time. So, if you want to fuck around and find out how your atheism Atheism is going to be destroyed by this Muslim philosopher, then please stay tuned. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I just wanted to share this thing with you because I've actually realized many people don't know how science works and even scientists don't know how science works. Oh, well, fuck. Did y'all hear that? Even scientists don't even understand fucking science. So glad we have this philosopher here to explain how all of science is fucking up now. So. Contemporary science, this is how it works. This is like the golden rule of how science, contemporary science works, be it physics, chemistry, biology, botany, any, any kind of science, that all physical phenomena have to be understood and they have to be interpreted within a naturalistic framework. What that means, that this naturalistic framework, means that the universe in this view is considered a closed box. And the causes for every event are attributed to forces or laws within this closed box. So event A leads to event B. Both A and B have to be understood and their causes have to be attributed to forces and laws within this closed box that we call the universe. Well, that we call the universe, but we also call just reality in general. Reality can also include multiple different universes. So it's not just contained to this one singular universe, but it is contained to this, what seems to be one singular reality. So to say that, well, things that happen in reality have to be understood by the properties and the forces and uh, all of the different mechanisms that work within reality. I feel like that's just a reasonable conclusion there. I don't see any reason to like go outside of that particular conclusion uh, just because it does make sense. But more importantly, it matches what we have experienced in the past. In the past, all phenomena that we've experienced have been explainable by processes that exist within reality. If something doesn't exist within reality, I don't understand how you can understand it within reality if it doesn't exist within reality. So, I mean, that just seems to be a nonsensical statement at that point. But also notice how she said, even scientists don't understand how science works. And then she goes on to basically explain like how we come to scientific conclusions. But I mean, she says that scientists don't understand this or is she talking about something else? I'm really not sure. So when, uh, you know, it's very interesting that you hear atheists saying, oh, there's no God because science discovered this. And, uh, you know, it's just nature that's running the world and everything happens because of natural laws. Well, I can't really think of any atheist right off the top of my head that says, oh, well, science has disproven God. Now, I'm not saying that those atheists don't exist out there. They could. And I would disagree with them about science disproving God. Now, if you were to say, well, science has disproved specific gods, like specific definitions of God, then I would agree. Like, for instance, since I'm reviewing a Muslim's video here, I would say that Allah, the God of Islam, uh, who is um, nearly identical to like Christianity's God as well as uh, Judaism's God because they're all Abrahamic gods, I would say that science can definitely refute that particular definition of God. Uh, and if you wanted me to just pull something out of my ass right now as to some kind of scientific evidence that disproves Allah, there are a number of uh, scientific claims that are made in the Quran that do not match up with reality, like this whole idea that meteorites or asteroids or something like that in the night sky are actually missiles that are aimed at demons. That is not true. And since Allah is supposed to be this omniscient and omnipotent being that uh, relayed this quote-unquote scientific information about missiles chasing down demons in the sky, I I would think that that totally refutes his whole this whole idea that Allah is uh, omnipotent, like he knows everything and he communicated this knowledge to humans. Like, I feel like the basic claims of uh, of Islam are just 
patently false about the characteristics of whatever God may exist, if one even does. So to say that science has disproved a specific definition, I feel is correct. But saying that science has disproved God in general, I think is overreaching a little bit. I feel like you can't really do a scientific experiment to prove that God doesn't exist. Like that's just not how shit works. So you would first need to try to prove that a God does exist. And that's what those various definitions of God that I just covered attempt to do, but all of them have failed. And so using that as a prior probability for any future claim about God or God in general, I guess you would be safe to say more than likely a God for whatever definition you might come up for, or uh, just in general, an idea about God probably doesn't exist. And so technically that's how you would argue in that particular way for the non-existence of God, or at least not believing in the existence of a God. That's just an assumption. It is just an assumption. This is just conjecture because there is no scientific proof for this. This is like taken as a uh, basic presupposition within science. There is no proof for something like this. Uh, that is not exactly true. There is a lot of proof for the assumption that natural processes can explain what happens in reality and everything that happens in reality has to be explained by some kind of a natural process. I feel like one assumption that an unjustified assumption that she is making is that this statement that things that happen within reality have to be explained by natural processes only includes the natural processes that we understand now. There could be natural processes Processes that we just don't know about that could be discovered in the future or defined in the future. Uh, we could come to a future understanding of a natural process that could explain some phenomena today that seems like magic to us. This primary assumption that she's working with that this is all limited, or at least that's how I interpret her to mean, like all of these natural processes are known to us now. I feel like if she's making that particular assumption, then that's a wrong-headed assumption to make and is not not representative of what scientists would say or atheists would say. So it ends up being a straw man argument. But ultimately, the assumption that natural forces or natural processes are needed to explain things that happen in reality has a lot of evidence behind it. So she's just wrong about there being no evidence or being an unjustified assumption. And the evidence would come in the form of something that I just mentioned a second ago. And that's how all of the phenomena that we've experienced in the past has been eventually explained by natural processes that we come to understand later. So considering that there are no phenomena in the past that has been explained by supernatural or magic explanations, that seems to indicate that more than likely any phenomena that occurs now that we just simply don't understand will be explained in the future when we discover more about this natural world, more about reality. So it's an assumption, but it's an assumption that's justified based on the evidence of our prior experiences as well as all the empirical evidence that su substantiate those prior phenomena being explained by natural processes. So just saying that it's unjustified uh, and unjustified assumption is just not accurate. And that actually tells us how the modern atheistic and scientific thought actually rests on such a flimsy foundation, an assumption, a conjecture. Just like uh, uh, Allah says in the Quran, uh, they are just following conjecture and uh, an assumption or conjecture does not avail against the truth there's, there's a whole world of a difference between truth and conjecture well I do agree that there's a world of a difference between truth and conjecture or speculation um, is, is how I like to characterize it. But I feel like the only one that's making a speculative statement here are the Muslims or rather those that use the Quran to prove that God exists because the Quran is filled with a bunch of speculative claims about God that don't actually pan out when we consider them in reality. When we put them under the micro microscope of science and we try to figure out like what actually happened or whether or not this could happen, a number of the claims in the Quran seem to fall apart. Uh, like 
For one thing, uh, it's said in the Quran that Muhammad jumped onto the back of a winged horse with a human face and rode all the way, rode that horse, human Pegasus hybrid, all the way to uh, the holy city. And so I just, I don't understand how that can happen in reality. Like that seems like a fantastical statement. But more so than that, it's a speculative statement uh, made on the basis of somebody just coming up with the shit and people just assuming that it was true. They didn't provide any kind of historical evidence to justify that particular claim. They didn't investigate that particular historical claim. Of course, there are a lot of instances in the Quran where investigating those claims or doubting the truth of those claims would call for your death. It, the point is, is that it's a speculative claim that was not investigated and people just believe it because the Quran says it happened. It's quite funny that this Muslim philosopher is trying to levy this particular accusation against atheists or scientists rather, when in reality, the Muslims are the ones that do it a lot of the time uh, in defending their God. And so it just comes off as more projection than anything else. So think about it. Isn't it uh, so childlike and stupid to have such extremely strong opinions premised on such flimsy uh, foundations of assumptions and conjecture? Yeah, it I mean, continuing with the projection here, that's got to be a, a weird place to be in, making such strong opinions based on pure speculation and conjecture. Weird. Think about it. Even, even somebody like me, literally, even somebody like me can have, can make, uh, let's say, a room or a house in which every process that takes place is is automatic, it's, it's controlled, it's programmed, the house is programmed, uh, and anybody who lives in it for too long will actually be convinced that, you know, it's a self-subsisting system. Everything happens within uh, this system by its own self. So it has its own laws. That's the first thing that we'll notice, and it's actually self-subsisting. But then only a child would actually understand it that way because any mature intellect would say, you know, uh, the power, the you know, programming... Uh, the effort has to come from somewhere outside the system, and it has to be obviously for a purpose. Well, I mean, in the particular example that we're working in, this is a human being that is setting up a house or a room to work automatically. And obviously that's going to have a creator or a designer because you are that creator or designer. And then it's going to have a purpose because you have a purpose for setting up that room that way. But comparing this to the universe is a bit of an equivalence fallacy. It's a false analogy fallacy um, because the universe having its own laws and just operating as reality does through natural laws and everything like that. We don't need anybody to be there in order for these natural processes to work in reality. Like typically the thing that I point out is uh, the water cycle, but you could do this with any other cycle that we have here on earth, like the rock cycle. There is no need for a God in the rock cycle. The rock cycle cycles without the need for any kind of intelligent designer in the middle of it. It just happens because that's the way reality operates. And like I said, you could do this for any other uh, natural process that we know about the formation of planets, the formation of galaxies, the formation of this universe itself is all guided not guided in the way that it's sentient, but is is all contained within these natural laws. They have to work by these natural laws. And just because we don't understand what all of these natural laws are now doesn't mean that we can't discover them in the future. But I think that it also means that we'll never know if we fully understand the universe. Like there, there's never going to be a point where we think, ah, we know everything in the universe, because that would mean that we know what everything in the universe is, like as far as natural laws go, to begin with, for us to know that we've achieved it. So it, it it's kind of a weird thing. So in that way, I'm purely agnostic on like the God question in general as to whether or not there is a God, because I don't think that we'll ever be able to really know whether or not there's a God. But I can guarantee you, he doesn't care if you jerk off on Sunday mornings instead of going to church. But still, back to this uh, little situation that um, she set up here. With this house, it's a false equivalence fallacy uh, or a false analogy fallacy because we don't have natural processes to explain why that room operates the way that it does without a human being to set it up and and set up everything that happens. We, we don't have a natural process to explain that, but we do have natural processes to explain things that happen in reality, like in this universe. We have natural processes to explain the water cycle or the rock cycle or how the earth formed or how the sun formed. Like all of those things are explainable without the 
need for a supernatural uh, wizard in the sky dictating everything. Also, lastly, I think it's extremely important that we understand, you know, we hear this word random, random a lot, whether it's in physics, random fluctuations, quantum fluctuations, random collapse of the wave function, random mutations in evolutionary biology. Everything is random, blind forces of nature. There's nothing goal-directed as such. There's nothing for a purpose. Everything is random. Why do we hear that word random always? She keeps using that word random, but it doesn't mean what I think that she thinks it means. Because random is basically some kind of event that happened that didn't have like a preceding reason or cause for it to happen. A good example of this in science is actually radioactive decay. Now, the decay rates of certain isotopes are known and they're consistent and uh, constant, but um, wh where the randomness gets in is which particular atom inside of that isotope actually degrades from the parent element to the daughter element is random. There is no discernible reason why one particular atom should uh, change from the parent element to the daughter element. Uh, and so we just, we don't know uh, what causes that. So it ends up being random. And there are other examples of randomness in science, things that we describe as random, but we describe them as random as if to say we don't know the cause or there is no cause uh, for it. Like uh, quantum tunneling can randomly happen without any kind of perceived cause, uh, that kind of thing. But um, I don't think that she actually understands what random actually means because she conflated a whole bunch of terms there, basically equivocating all these terms. And so um, I feel like maybe she needs to get like a better understanding of what random means in science since she's presenting an argument against scientific descriptions of reality. Because of this kind of a uh, methodology. This is what it is because when you're assuming, when you're making these conditions that I'm only going to attribute every event and every um, process that takes place within this closed system, I am going to attribute it to within the system, to laws and uh, processes within the system. I'm actually going to cancel out everything, every explanation from outside. So that's your assumption. Yes, it is an assumption that things that happen within reality are explainable by the processes, mechanisms, in reality, um, I feel like that's a very rational and reasonable and logical conclusion to come to. Now, if you can prove that things outside of this reality can have an effect on things inside this reality, please do. Now, her being a Muslim philosopher, I'm sure that she includes the Quran or other supposed miracles in the Islamic understanding of God to be examples of something from outside of reality having an effect on something inside of reality. But the problem is, is that those miracles or those magic tricks is, is I've really, as more I've thought about it, I feel like magic trick is still an applicable thing to classify them as. But in any case, these miracles uh, that are done by God, by Allah, I, I feel like there's no substantiating evidence for those. And there's no reason to think that those miracles actually happened and that we can explain whatever phenomena or whatever event that occurred that was explained by these miracles, uh, we can explain them naturally. So it's not that we are content containing reality by saying that, oh, things outside of reality can't affect it. It's just that from our experience, everything that has happened in our past has been explained by natural processes. What that means is that if there is any phenomena that happens in the future or any event that happens in the future that we don't understand right now or can't explain right now with the natural uh, processes that we know about, then it will be at some point in the future. That's just the likelihood of that happening. Now, that doesn't rule out that God could have cast a magic trick in order to make it happen, but I feel like you would need to do a lot of legwork in order to prove that those supernatural things can happen in this reality. Because as of yet, that has not been proven definitively as far as science is concerned. Which puts it in kind of a tricky situation because if science can describe those supernatural things, then those supernatural things automatically become natural things. So this box that she's talking about, it has grown several times over the course of human understanding of 
our reality because it starts off one size and then we notice things that we can't explain just as of yet. And in, and when we can't explain them, that box grows to include those things inside of reality because those things are happening in reality. And so if God were to be uh, proven in the future, then our scientific box called reality here would expand enough to include God in our observations and our conclusions. The fact is, is that we have not done that yet because there's not good enough evidence to expand our box to include God. Obviously, this Muslim philosopher thinks that we're strictly adhering to this one size of the box that only includes the things that we understand now. But that's really not how science works because science is constantly expanding our knowledge. We're constantly figuring new things out about our reality. And so it's a really kind of a straw man argument that she's presenting here against science. Not really against atheism, but against science. That's your uh, take. That is your conjecture. So when you can't actually get an explanation of why this uh, thing would happen, you say it's random. It's random. Just like that child inside the fully programmed room would be like when uh, he or she wouldn't be able to actually get an explanation. They would say it's random. We don't know why it would happen. It just randomly happens. You see, this is why I think that she doesn't really understand what random means, and maybe she needs to reevaluate her understanding of random. I don't think that a scientist would say, oh, that's random, because that seems to be more of a concrete answer than I think any scientist would actually come to, because what the more logical and reasonable uh, conclusion to come to, at least at first, before deciding that it's random, it would be that I don't know. Like, why did that happen? I don't know. Like, that's the reasonable conclusion to come to until you can prove that it's random, meaning that there is no reason behind this particular thing happening until you get to that point. Um, you can't really call anything random. You just say you don't understand it or I don't know. So I feel like she's still further uh, equivocating the word random as well as providing a false analogy when she starts talking about the understanding of a child, which is kind of funny because Muslims also use children uh, when, when describing how easy it is to understand that God exists. Like they say, it's so easy a child can understand it. Well, now, and I'm not saying that this Muslim philosopher has made this particular argument, but now we have a Muslim philosopher that's saying, oh, well, children, they're just, they just think things are random and they're just little stupid drunk people. Not saying I disagree with that last assertion there, but uh, it's just funny to see how they can use children uh, to suit their needs in this explaining of God that they attempt to do. So, th so we can clearly see that this is circular reasoning. It's not a rational argument. You assume in your premise that all physical phenomena be explained by natural forces and laws. Therefore, in your conclusion, everything is natural and there's nothing that is uh, supernatural. Well, uh, again, that particular understanding of it has God uh, as being supernatural all the time, uh, when if we actually could prove God to exist, then he would be worked into our natural reality as a natural entity in it. So it God would then become part of reality. So uh, that particular divide right there, I feel like she's focusing a bit too much on, as if to say that atheists are dogmatic in what they consider to be natural explanations. When in reality, we have uh, instances in our past where our reality box, if you will, has grown several times to include new phenomena, to include new natural processes and new understandings of our reality. But you assume that first. An assumption cannot be a conclusion. It's kind of funny because there's a there are a lot of Muslim apologists out there that do exactly that for Allah. They assume that Allah exists and then use the Quran to prove that Allah exists. Talk about a fucking circular argument. So we can clearly see this is stupidity. And imagine that. Imagine making bold assumptions, bold claims. Entire worldview, the atheistic worldview is that nothing of this has any purpose, it, nothing of this has any meaning, everything is meaningless, everything is purposeless, we need to find our own meaning, everything should be redefined based on what? Based on one stupid assumption. 
Uh, no, it's not all based on one assumption. It's just a uh, natural progression after you admit that you don't know whether or not a God exists. And if you're not adhering to the idea that your life, the sum total of your life, should be to praise and worship that God, which is what the Abrahamic God um, uh, requires, uh, the Abrahamic God being th the same God that uh, Muslims worship, uh, it would seem like what she's saying here to decipher the religious language is to say, well, atheists, they don't think that they should live only to please God and they should live to uh, get the most out of life, to enjoy life to its fullest. They don't have God at the forefront of their minds, so they're just making up their own meaning. And I'm not disagreeing with the make up your own meaning part, but I feel like making up your own meaning or finding your own meaning in your life is just as reasonable. Well, I personally, I feel like it's a bit more reasonable than spending your entire life to uh, praise uh, one particular deity all, uh, above all others um, and unquestioningly worshiping that particular deity. Like I think spending your entire life doing that is really not enjoying your particular life to the fullest. Uh, and I feel like enjoying your life to the fullest, realizing that this is the only life that you have, I feel like that can maximize how much you get out of this life. And I don't think that it's a negative aspect of that particular view to uh, be more concerned about your own life because it is your life. You see, a lot of religious people, Muslims included, as well as Christians and some Jews out there, they think that it's more virtuous to give up your life for this God. But in my view, this God is really just some asshole 2000 or in the case of Islam, it's a little over 1500 years ago. Some asshole is saying, well, this is the God that exists. He wants you to do this for him. And he wants you to do all of these other things for him and to have him constantly on your mind. And that's what you do to get into heaven. And I, I feel like that's just some asshole 1500 years or more of uh, in the past that's telling me these things, and I really don't think that that guy should dictate what I do with my life. And I don't think that other people that uh, agree with that guy should be able to dictate my life, or other people that are on that side that disagree with the other guys, and th they have a different view of things. Like, I don't think that they should dictate my life. I think that I should be able to dictate my life. I should be able to dictate what my life means and the purpose in my life, and I don't think that that's a negative aspect of it. it, it I feel like it's a very very positive aspect. Uh, I just totally disagree with the, this Muslim philosopher here. All in all, uh, I found her argument to be totally unconvincing. She um, starts off with this false assumption about atheists and I guess scientists really, because this is more about the scientific explanation for the universe and everything like that. And not so much like an atheistic explanation. She didn't really cover much of the atheistic explanation. She just seemed to equivocate atheists and scientists or science in general. And so I'm just not convinced by her argument at all because she started off with a false premise and uh, ended up straw manning us the entire video. So um, if you will, please go down below. Let me know what you thought about this Muslim philosopher's argument. Uh, do you think that, that, that this means that atheism is bunk or do you think that, uh, you know, her argument was kind of shit? Let me know down below in the comments. While you're down there, why don't you smash that like button and subscribe if you like this kind of content. Don't forget to stand up and use your voice. Bye, heathens.